Hello everyone. Welcome to an all new episode of the Indic Explorer show. I am your host Vineet. Please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to the channel. Ours is a cultural podcast and one of the most important facets of Indian culture is its rich and colorful and full of flavor and wholesome cuisine. and to talk about indian food and indian cuisine and indian cooking uh i have with me a very special guest today on the show uh suveer saran namaste suveer welcome to the show namaste vineet thank you for having me so among other things suveer is the first person to get a michelin star for the restaurant devi and uh, that's quite a unique accomplishment because i've been told by a lot of people suveer that indian cuisine doesn't lend itself well to a michelin star so the first question i would want to ask you is uh, how was that process like so the myth that indian cuisine doesn't lend itself to a michelin star is just a myth all cuisines are michelin worthy our food is certainly worthy of a michelin star uh cooking in our restaurant settings our expectations of our own cuisine in a restaurant setting our patronage of restaurants as indians that leaves much to the imagination and that is a shameful act that we perpetrate every day on ma bharati on mother india and if i were the michelin guide i would not give indian food any michelin star recognition because when a people of a nation are ashamed of their mother cuisines when they are uh, b- b- hiding them in their homes giving them a bad bad rep in the public sphere when they are ashamed to bring their everyday cooking to a table at a restaurant those people are terribly broken uh, terribly uh, jailed in their mindscapes and maimed by their own lack of imagination the foods of india from across its many regions not to south east to west central hilly uh, plateau uh, plain regions uh, riverside seaside mountain side or in the depths of the deepest gangetic plains plains is a varied cuisine that changes locally regionally seasonally and with all the uh, religious uh, festivals and festivities that take place in a weekly monthly annual basis that cuisine should be represented as such in our restaurants but never finds a table of pride where it's showcased butter chicken dal makhani uh, tandoori chicken and uh, sambar idli dosa uh, vada vada pav pav bhaji jaini pizza when that is a language and length and breadth and heft of a nation's culinary imagination it's not a cuisine worthy of any accolades let alone a michelin star guide Uh, indulgence so when we come of age and we are able to serve everyday dal chawal the thalis the khichdis and the uh, khichda and the haleem and the uh, rogan josh and the uh, chola bhatura of homes then indian cuisine comes of age people realize that there's heft and depth and uh, veritas and great uh, 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 beauty of both lightness and a volume of expression to this cuisine and we'll come of age and we'll see all the guidebooks of the world flocking to india with not only their stars but also the customers that want to discover a new uh, culinary destination till then we are a broken nation of terrible cuisine and no wonder hospitals full of people with metabolic syndrome diabetes hypertension and obesity and all the other diseases that come from uh, ill ingestion of terrible foods wow that's quite an uh, a lot of thoughts packed in that so i want to first when i talk to a person i want to understand the cause that they you know lived their life for and i want to know and i want you to go back to your past what did a young suveer what was he thinking and how did he actually you know the journey of how did he actually decide to take up this path so young suveer didn't have any um even the faintest of dream 
that 50-year-old Subir would be sitting talking to Vineet about cuisine as being his vocation, profession, passion. I uh, got came of age wanting to be a doctor or a singer, classical Hindustani singer or an artist. And I'm doing none of the three. I'm now uh, cooking food. When I arrived in uh, Bombay at the age of 18, 19, and went to Sir J.J. School of Art, where two seats were given to non-Maharashtra students to study the arts, I came to a, a state, Maharashtra, with great pride in their uh, Maratha uh, history and culture. So that Maharashtra, um, when I was going to school, welcomed me, the Bombayites, who were cosmopolitan citizens of the globe, with open heart, uh, arms and big hearts. How did I uh, make friends? By calling people to my uh, YMCA apartment. Uh, I lived in the working men's YMCA while going to school in Bombay. And I would cook there at friends' homes, serve meals in my room, or friends would invite me to their tables where I would cook and then feed other people. I even had the pleasure of cooking for Nana Chudasama, who was the mayor. So my home's cooking repertoire, the repertoire of my aunts and uncles and relatives and friends and neighbors and aunties made it with me to Bombay. And people were shocked that this Delhiite cooked food from around India, but also uh, food that was prepared with love with uh, a connection to the seasons, to communities of India that were different. And they appreciated that. And then I moved two years later to New York at the age of 20. And I did the same thing there while working, while going to school, while doing two full-time jobs and school full-time. Every night I entertained from around 8.39 till around 2 in the morning, washed dishes, went to bed at 4, woke up at 7, took breakfast for employees wherever I worked. And one day a person gave me millions of dollars and said, open a restaurant. And from retail and marketing and PR, I went into food by accident because a man believed in me and reputation had spread that an Indian man in New York City cooked some of the best meals in Manhattan, not just Indian meals. And that's how I got into the food business. A series of accidents, uh, very welcoming people in New York and desperate Indians who were very keen to eat food other than butter chicken, dal makhni, paneer makhni, and, you know, the biryanis that we are used to. And they loved that I was making bharva, karela, tinda, zimikanka, kofta, uh, litti, choka. You know, they, I was doing the regional cuisine of India and people loved it. And they uh, uh, indulged me. And soon I, my, one of my dishes made it to the cover of New York magazine. Next, Zagat was calling me the hottest caterer in town. Then I was cooking a 80th birthday party for Abe Rosenthal, the editor-in-chief of the New York Times. And then... For Steve uh, Weissman's 50th birthday was the India head for the New York Times and then was living in New York at that time. One thing led to another, opportunities came and I got into food. Very interesting journey there and a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, the way some sometimes life takes you, I mean, it's far more uh, uh, exhilarating than what we would even plan, right? I mean, that's the, that's the thing that I take away from your story. I, I tell people if we live... Connected to life, the opportunities life brings our way. If we just open our minds and hearts to living rather than being goats and, you know, uh, uh, sheep actually more than goats, sheep give up to uh, people bigger, to humans, to pressures from the environment, goats fight. So I often tell people, be, don't be sheep, don't be sheeple, be individuals that should be proud of their individual uh, strengths, their differences, the uh, their little spice in the little bigger box of spices that is the world. And if you allow ourselves to shine and breathe and take and think differently from the other on either side and front and back, we can find value in ourselves and in doing so also appreciate the other. And when we do that, life sends us so many opportunities that we just don't grab every minute that we live. And if you learn to live in sync with life, we have greater chances of discovering who we really are. And I'm a living example. I had no, I didn't grow up wanting to do food. But today I find myself immersed in it deeply and I'm deeply proud of it. And it's all a series of accidents that led me. Yeah, nice. Uh, so because you did a lot of your work in the US, right? And uh, in a way you've taken Indian cuisine global or to the West. So, and 
you've used modern techniques of preparation and all of that so how do you maintain and i think this is where the main challenge i feel you might have faced uh how do you maintain authenticity of the indian cuisine while still innovating around the traditional flavors and using newer methods of preparation how do you kind of maintain that balance so i think authenticity is a uh... misused abused misunderstood underappreciated term. authenticity doesn't uh, define a cuisine or a item or a commodity as being better than others authenticity can be both a, a beauty and a bane of a commodity or a, a cuisine or an art form of any kind because in chasing authenticity we can become didacts and uh unfortunate people who don't uh, grow with the times and are, and who aren't living in the times they represent with their uh, there and now of being part of a world they inhabit at this moment so there was a chinese scholar whose name i'm forgetting right now because i'm in the in air and my i'm having a brain freeze and in the uh, uh, first in the forward to my first book indian home cooking that sold a quarter million copies in counting which is phenomenal for any book let alone a cookbook it's called indian home cooking and michael batterberry the father of american uh, f- food writing of publishing wrote in that that his book is as authentic to india as any will ever be because we lives in the times he lives in with a deep connection to the past the history stories and realities of india's past with deep respect and understanding of his today with great care and uh, f- foresight given to what tomorrow shall be for india and the world and in linking those bridges past and future with his life today he is able to live authentically like chinese scholars have urged the chinese to do forever because then being present in this here and now with great respect for what was with great concern for what shall be you create with the best intentions the greatest art forms that you can ever be part of because you know what was you worry about what shall be and you invest wholly in this here and now and i think that's what makes the cuisine authentic and so for me bringing that to the tables of new york as a chef was an easy call because i cooked my grandmother's food plated it in the uh, implements and that were available to me in manhattan which were varied from all across the world that were very 21st century and rooted in arts and culture of the planet and i cooked with the tools given to me in america and made the cooking of my grandmother easier more palatable more interesting more colorful more varied because i had a abundance of uh, ingredients and all to play with and i still connected them to the histories and uh, traditions of our family and my people and presented it as if enjoyed it today and made sure it was sustainable it was uh, correct it was healthy nutritive and also told a story that would be more interesting to people coming by tomorrow So I think that's the link I made, and it was uh, first for Indian cuisine and perhaps for many other cuisines because in New York people weren't doing that, and that helped make my name a name that people respected because it came with authenticity that was both uh, connected to culture and history, but also to a human being living in that moment in time. That's really interesting, and I think the Chinese philosopher, probably the one you're looking for, was Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu, and I am also a big fan of Lao Tzu's philosophy, Taoism, because it talks about going with the flow. I mean, exactly who it was. It was exactly. So, uh, I mean, uh, so you would have come across a lot of uh, myths about Indian cuisine, and I think one takeaway that I get from your uh, what you've told me is that taking our food in the homes out into the world is something that we haven't done well enough. I think. that that is probably the biggest problem that we face because when i go to northern india and eat north indian food and i'm a vegetarian uh all i see is aloo or paneer in different forms and sometimes i wonder are you know people in northern india only eating these two vegetables because veg like there are a lot of vegetarians and i'm sure that at home they eat a wide variety of stuff but in restaurants you just get these two things in some form or the other so any myths to bust in this scarily i must say that um, heterosexual 
North Indian men have, are raised by perhaps parents that are not bullish enough in giving these young men and even some of the women enough of a, a, a tough education on what eating is. We are still finding too much paneer in aloo in Indian homes as well as, of course, in our restaurants. But in our homes, my home, all the vegetables were celebrated. They came seasonally, annually. And we waited for those to arrive. We celebrated their arrival. We were hungry to eat them in season. And uh, But I must admit, even I was an aberration and exception. Even today, uh, when I eat parval, karela, zimikan, uh, yams, and all kinds of uh, other tindala, tinda, tindola, you know, these people are shocked. That's, what are you doing? Why aren't you just eating aloo and paneer? They're so boring. Luckily, my mother didn't, wasn't a paneer fan. I uh, didn't, uh, it does nothing for me. When I met Dr. Shashi Tharoor and he said to me, Suvir, you're a cooking vegetarian. I want you to cook the 21st birthday meal for my kids. They're vegetarian too. I want to bring them to your table because I know you create good vegetarian khana. And he understood that paneer and aloo will not be the celebration and the stars, that there'll be so much more. We North Indians have a gazillion ways of making a gazillion veggies. Unfortunately, in many homes and of course, almost entirely in our restaurants, it's a monolithic cuisine. I guess you can add two or three lids to them. But they're, they're horrible. Paneer and uh, alu. Even Chinese is uh, studied with paneer and alu. Indian, Indian Chinese, North Indian Chinese. The Tinjabi food. It's scary. It's disgusting. And it's the reason we are not going forward with our cuisine. Singing and dancing in a pluralistic manner. And celebrating the great depth of our cuisine. The day we appreciate our veggies. The way we appreciate how we cook with them how we uh, add layered sophistry of texture, flavor, discovery to every dish we make with a vegetable. Nobody in the planet can compete with our food. We are the richest plant-based cuisine of the planet. And we make plant uh, 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 food, plant-based food, the best that anybody can ever make. There's a reason I'm the only chef on the Nutritionist Advisory Board of Brigham and Women Hospital, the teaching arm of Harvard Medical School. My good looks don't get me there. I'm not that good looking. But the arsenal of recipes I've found from north and south of India, east and west of India, and all places across India, these veggies, for the most part, sing and dance in people's taste buds and palates and make them healthy, healthier versions of themselves and yet more satiety-rich people. And this is the food of India. We need to bring it to every table that we call a restaurant and make, make people understand that our food can be seasonal, regional, rich, Light. It's, our food isn't it's fatty and rich and greasy. It's a myth that we have to cook with uh, ounces and ounces of ghee and butter and cream. That's crap. India was the ultimate cucina povera, the food of poverty, because we were a poor people for so long. We've learned the art and craft of making food rich without calories and rich with flavor without cream and butter and ghee and cheese and all that rubbish. Our food is a sensible food made with very crafty people, men and women who cooked. And we must go back to those uh, food ways and we'll, rich, better, we'll live uh, richer lives and healthier and better lives in doing so. So I want to ask you, because I've heard this a lot, that historically the kind of cuisine that was consumed in India, like for example, you've mentioned about the richness and adding a lot of ghee. The other thing is about spicy food, right? Uh, this conversation has come up that we put a lot of spices today, but in the past, we actually used to use, uh, you know, pepper, not chili. And uh, our food wasn't as spicy. The problem I, uh, I've i been told, and I have also not tasted a lot of non-spicy Indian food, is that uh, when you put a lot of spices, the natural flavors don't emerge. And when you uh, uh, the the you only experience the taste of the spices rather than the food itself, usually a spice should kind of blend in and just add a tinge of flavor and not take over the whole food itself. So I'm not sure how that is, but this is what I've been told by some friends who are you know in this field. And uh, when someone who is eating a lot of spicy Indian food suddenly switches to that pepper or, you know, the less spicy version in the way our ancestors consumed it. Uh, initially, their palate really doesn't know how to adjust because they are used to the heavy dose of spice. But then eventually you train yourself to experience it. I, I want your take on 
this subject there's no correct way of eating you know uh, food is as subjective as any other art form and yes our food wasn't meant to be it didn't have the uh, heat from chilies but heat from chilies is one heat it's a heat that dies at early death the heat from all the other spices is the lingering heat in indian food it isn't the chilies don't give lasting damage to the palate or lasting pleasure the chili is a frontal heat it will bite your tongue it will burn your lips it will heat up the mouth but then done it's the black pepper the cloves the cinnamon the korean the the cardamom the black cardamom the star anise the fenugreek the bay leaf the cumin seeds the coriander when you cook them in oil when you powder and add them those are creating layers of flavoring that don't yell and scream in your front palate they go and unsettle your insides they make you sweat as you start eating they hit you a few minutes after you've taken the first bite they'll be continuing to hit you for an hour after you've finished eating that's the heat that unsettles many across the planet about indian cuisine and unfortunately we blame it all on the uh, hot chili peppers but the chili peppers weren't part of our diet either so when people tell me oh indian food is incendiary and hot they are talking about those green chilies red chilies that bite your tongue and it's like oh. and that's an immediate assault they are not they weren't part of our cooking till the uh, portuguese and the spanish and the other foreign invaders coming and brought them into our land and we've adopted them we've uh, grown accustomed to them we celebrate them we are the largest importer and the largest producer of chilies in the planet and that's how much we love it so uh, i think spicy food is it's been an indian mainstay forever we didn't cook with as aggressive an amount of spice as we do today my mother often says uh, affluenza is killing india more than anything else it's how we become brain dead and maimed ourselves into going with popular uh, demands made by leaders and celebrities and influencers we forget we were meant to be smart people having been a poor people having been a, a nation that had been ravaged and pillaged and looted and plundered we made do with what we had and we did it beautifully so for the longest of times even though we had we were the spice capital of the world we couldn't afford our own spices we had fruits and nuts but we couldn't afford them in great quantities and amounts we lived with moderation out of necessity not because we wanted to as we've gotten richer we've forgotten moderation we've um, thrown out the thinking caps that the indians had become famous for and in over indulging we are damaging our insides our guts our minds and our, our, our future as well through our mean thinking but i think our old food ways were very moderate and indian food isn't about aggression of any kind it's a symphony of flavors when every dish and in, in the a handful of dishes brought to a meal each dish has a different personality trait that is glorified that is suggestive that's celebrated that's a marker for why it's on the table another has different personality a third another and that what we did was between hot sour salty sweet bitter astringent calming cooling crispy coarse smooth cold warm room temperature colorful white pale green yellow we we gave all our senses satiety excitement and uh, indulgence and in doing so we created that chappan bhog the 56 offerings that in their coming together made for a perfect meal fit for the gods exciting for humans and rich with satiety and as we go to that way of cooking and eating and sharing and uh you know providing for people in restaurants and homes well, how can we go wrong that's why mother india ma bharati will continue shining and leading people to greater light and uh, satiety and better health and great future you know i have always wanted to have the chappan bhog i don't know where to find it but yeah it's 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 in your heart and mind in your uh, kitchen with your whoever if you cook with somebody cook alone it doesn't have to be 56 if you indulge yourself enough to get as i said different textures different temperatures different colors the, the hot sour salty sweet bitter astringent when you bring all of this to the table in five or 56 ways you still bring excitement and uh, satiety good health and imagination and discovery all at once oh 
do you know of any less known regional dishes in india which you think should find greater popularity both internationally and probably even amongst indians like maybe if it's local to a certain place but other indians also need to taste it so we are talking about things beyond your the you know the regular common dishes that we all know about right so yeah no like more koi rambar uh you know the butter milk sambar uh, how delicious is yeah. it anybody will fall in love with it then the similar version of the curry from gujarat a version of that from up a version of that from punjab you know the pakoda edition changes in north india the, how the pakoda is made from up to bihar to punjab changes one dish one idea stretched through the indian landscape from bengal to southern india to maharashtra to gujarat to northern indian plains from madhya pradesh all the way to kashmir that version of a yogurt based curry changes entirely in its form shape and taste and flavor but is comforting to people across the regions and should we should have it celebrated in many forms on our menus we can do the same thing with a, a, a dish as simple as a Uh, you know cumin potatoes in southern india they come laced with turmeric and onions sometimes they're in the tamil and tamram homes which is asafoetida and uh, mustard seeds cumin seeds curry leaf and uh, dried red chilies and it's yummy and then as it comes from southern india to northern india the tempered spices coriander and cumin get added the seeds and the green leaves that get added in its curry leaf coriander comes in dhania comes in green chilies find their way into that dish you know we can see the variations that come in alive as you travel but then there are these pickles gongura pickle gongura chutney uh, uh, gongura uh, 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 you know what you, the uh, uh, the word uh, pachri gongura pachri it's yummy nobody knows it but a little bit in yogurt a little bit in rice uh, a little bit rubbed in chicken when i use a gongura pickle and rub it in chicken and then grill it that chicken gets a personality like none other so you know, we we just have to go out and rasam i make a shrimp rasam a lobster lobster rasam that uh, i am using the broth made out of the shells of these uh, shellfish and then making a tomato or a lemon or a black pepper rasam i can change the way this uh, seafood rasam comes alive and southern indians northern indians uh, swiss french dutch uh, north africans they all fall in love with it So you know, we we just have to open our minds and hearts into thinking that we'll do something other than what we are used to. Go to Bengal potol bhaji. It's parval. It's this vegetable. It's a gourd, and they cook potol poshto and they call potol sabzi. And the churmur potol is a crispy potol. It's just cut into fours and then cooked very crispy. It's better than any potato chip anybody can ever eat. Then they make it poshto with a crushed poppy seeds. it becomes a curry laga lipta sauce a little sauce that hugs the vegetable and it's yummy that how can anybody say no to a vegetable and you know so then karela bharwa karela in my home at our table when people eat stuffed bitter gourds they were they cry that they've never eaten a vegetable so delicious and it's a bitter vegetable that they want to keep going back to eating a second a third a tenth and eleventh stuffed bitter melon so the uh, that gazillion dishes i can talk about and each from different regions of india we have to just open our minds into embracing our cuisine we love to try foreign things but our own things are not sexy enough they're not cool enough they're not special enough because there are mothers and grandmothers recipes so we have to go past that yeah absolutely some of the dishes you mentioned i have had especially the gongura and the, you know the pachadi so <laughs> i attest to that more people need to have that yeah and the pachadi with just rice it's amazing You, you know, it's, and you start salivating, and you want more. Then you enjoy all the vegetables that don't look sexy. But once your mouth is watering with the pachri, all the ugly vegetables become your best friends because you're enjoying them more and more. And they are packed with nutrition and good health. Uh, there is one preparation that I've really liked. It's a Keralaite dish, I think. It's Adi Pradaman, which is a form of paisam, which is a uh, milk paisam and jaggery. It's amazing. I mean. <laughs> I never had heard it until very recently, but yeah, that's. Yeah, and I haven't heard that, but I knew some of the paisan. But I'll have to tell maybe Doctor Thiru to have his team make me some. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah. So what I wanted to talk, like in your cookbooks, I think you delve into how you know the preparation methods. 
but you also have a lot of focus on the history or the, or the cultural context of the dish being prepared right as someone who's a connoisseur of food uh how important do you think uh knowing that kind of context is when you're trying out dishes you know uh, to appreciate my cookbooks my first book indian home cooking was perhaps the first time in america and i guess around the world that a book came with a little story with every recipe in the book we had over 125 recipes in the first book and so we had chapter introductions we had regional introductions to indian cuisine but every recipe came with a note as to why i chose that recipe to be in that book and those recipe head notes weren't just history they were about durga ravi setty a friend of mine that taught me how to make tomato pachri gongra pickle whose mother taught me how to say sambar and not sambar like the deer so you know these stories came out in the book and why is it important because a no chef no human being an artist of any kind whether they are visual artists or a culinary culinarians we don't live in boxes and vacuum we've lived with the world we've been fed and indulged by the world some of us have traveled around the world we can't take credit for everything that comes out of our hands onto our plates that we give to others we it's part of a continuum and in celebrating the story of where you first grabbed a bite where you found inspiration for a version of a recipe you're cooking today that connects the dots for people it opens up their minds into realizing the world is one we take people to vasudeva kutumbakam one people one globe one village one you know planet and that is very enriching for a human being that a there are more like them around the world that uh, recipes have a place in this world beyond just eating it also makes them think of cooking and the act of eating as being more than just like a, 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 a you know a robotic uh, indulgence and it connects us to culture to history to people to the planet to our rich legend and we we are excited about eating and it makes it an act where you talk at the table you talk to one another you heal and you inspire and you connect and you uh, give reason to believe and i think that cultural aspect of food is so important we are all losing it i always tell people families that eat and celebrate together will live happier richer life live richer life forever so we must do that too many of us are now eating while on a gym bicycle or while walking from home to work or that's not eating you're just taking calories in eating is a social indulgence that comes with this give and take and so recipe with a story will have the host and the chef who made the recipes share that story with others that will lead to questions and answers a breaking of a marriage a making of a marriage who knows what and that is the social uh, make up of a good recipe of a good uh, story a good uh, a dinner party and uh, memories that leave people excited forever i think that's the part a recipe plays so i have two interesting trivia questions one is uh, is there any food preparation that really uh, changed the way you think about you know about the whole process like something that really shaped you like trying something out maybe experimenting something new or trying something that is old but it really shaped you like making that dish really shaped you or changed the way you thought about uh you know uh this profession in itself and the second thing i wanted to uh like you know kind of ask you is uh, any good trivia about a famous person whom you prepared something for and you know someone who really understood what you were trying to convey so i uh, threw the food so i've taken i take pride in having cooked for the who's who of the planet but i never kiss and tell and um, i suffice it to uh, believe me when i tell you i've cooked for kings queens uh, st- head of heads of states top actors and actresses indian and non bollywood bollywood all of them and why they keep coming back for more is not just the flavor and taste of the food i cook for them but also that their uh, private lives remain live private with me and i've uh, i've valued that and protected them and myself by not revealing what they eat how they eat where they eat but i've cooked 50th, 50th birthday 75th 80th wedding anniversaries weddings for celebrities all over uh, they keep coming back because they enjoy the food they enjoy the dignity and respect i afford them 
and the privacy that I got for them. Um, there were people who, uh, uh, like the king of Morocco, the, whose son is now the king, to uh, uh, Al Gore, who was vice president, who didn't, uh, who told said publicly they loved my food. Um, I've cooked for uh, Hollywood celebrities. I've been on the back cover of Shilpa Shetty's first cookbook. These are names I can drop because they've dropped my name with them. Um, but you know, I think they come back to a man who uh, cooks with passion. But uh, what have I learned through my journey as a chef? I think the basic thing the kitchen taught me is that mistakes make us richer versions of ourselves and better craftsmen and better uh, 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 professionals in our realm of uh, trading and business. So once I was making a Himachali uh, apple chutney and I'd made the chutney and I told the chef to turn off the stove in my uh, passion of trying out the recipe and eating and sharing it with others and making them taste how delicious as Himachal uh, sweet and sour spicy chutney was. I didn't look to see if the chef had actually turned down the stove. He hadn't. So an hour and a half later when we went back, the, back to the stove to serve the meal, the chutney had been burnt. But right in the middle of the pan, caught one teaspoon out of four gallons, eight liters of chutney. One teaspoon was salvaged. And that was the most delicious chutney I've ever eaten in my lifetime and shall ever. And it made its way to my restaurant. We called it the caramelized apple chutney. So now I learned a new trick of caramelizing onions and making an apple chutney with this bitter caramel sweet texture. And people at Devi, my restaurant that got the first Michelin star for any Indian restaurant in North America, we served that as a side condiment and people would have culinary orgasms at the table eating it. So I always tell people that in your life, mistakes happen for a reason. We should remember that a mistake is a moment to uh, learn a new trick, um, remember what not to repeat in the future and be mindful and present and uh, do something that should show your masterful your mastery over a, 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 a way of living. For me, it was cooking by acting in the moment and realizing, look, I tried something new today. So not all was lost. That was one moment. But what I also learned and was able to employ in my second and third books, American Masala and Masala Farm, is the kitchen alchemy that Indian cooking teaches us of frying spices in oil. When we do that, we coax out the flavor of uh, potent ingredients, spices, and in doing so, bring the essential oil into a pan. How we fry the spices, at what temperature we add the spice to the oil, how slowly or fast we cook the spice, and in what progression we add them. That's the talent a chef has in them. When I came back to India uh, five years ago, five and a half years ago, and started teaching my cadre of young chefs how to cook with me, I was surprised that they told me they're... Uh, the, uh, great grand master Indian chefs whose names you would know, who have restaurants that Indians uh, 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 frequent and call amazing names and call them the best in the country, that those chefs A, never cooked with their teams and B, would send YouTube uh, instructions of other people's videos to say, copy this and make this sauce this way. They would come and taste and say, yeah, it works. So these, these teams of Indian chefs were shocked that a chef within his 40s, an executive chef, cooks in the kitchen eight, nine, 11 hours a day. And I said, I don't know you. You don't know me. You don't know my style of cooking. So I would teach them cooking. And they were shocked that I brown onions and cook spices on my own. I grind powders and I uh, make my spice mixes. And they were shocked. They said, this doesn't happen in Indian kitchens. And they took the names of all the top Indian restaurants you can think of. And they said, we worked here, we worked here. These chefs don't cook. Chef, you should sit. I said, no, I want to teach you. So I've now created a few mini-meats who are now bigger than me. Vardhan and Hari are my left and my right arm, chefs I met when they were in their early 20s. They saw from me how to salt a dish, how to uh, coax the flavors out of an uh, ingredient like a spice. And when we learned that, when I applied those same tricks to Italian cooking, to French cooking, to Vietnamese cooking, to Thai cooking, I can take a pasta and make it a better version of a pasta. I was lucky to have the Ely family Ili coffee is the world's finest coffee and they're the greatest purveyors of fine, fine coffee on the planet. And uh, the Ili family flew from Italy when my restaurant tapestry was opened in New York in 2017 and brought their uh, important members of their teams to dine at tapestry because they thought an Indian boy in New York City 
was making some of the finest pastas in the world. So I was doing nothing new. There was nothing Indian about my pastas. But how I indulged Italian aromatics and flavorings and cooked them with the Indian technique and brought out greater flavor, richer flavor, gave better satiety to guests. And it wasn't an Indian addition of taste, but the Indian sensibility guiding me in the kitchen. And similarly, French technique, Italian techniques guide me as an Indian chef. That I brought those tools to my arsenal and created a cuisine that's more modern, contemporary, lighter, even more robust and flavorful without being richer, heavier, greasier than the versions made in India with tools that weren't as fantastical as the ones available in the West. So that's what the kitchen is taught. The interesting thing that you spoke here was, you know, like when there's a mistake and uh, that happens and, uh, you know, in your line of work, you would be dealing with the who's who of the world, right? And so <laughs> the impact of a mistake is that much more. How you actually go about facing that situation and fixing it is is an art as well, right? Like doing it right and then correcting if something's gone wrong is a different art altogether, right? And it's an immediate reaction because it's, as the Buddha said, you know, every action has an instant and uh, reaction. So it's, you can't uh, just say sorry and get away with it. You have to appreciate, reflect upon, immediately change, improve and make somebody happy and smile and move, move on. And that's the sign of a professional. That's the sign of a, a mindful human being and the beginnings and the makings of a consummate professional who will have perhaps greater guarantee of success. But there's no guarantee of success but greater opportunity of uh, meeting success than another because you're thinking smart, you're thinking on your feet and you are uh, just being mindful at the right time. Who are your biggest inspirations in the field and uh, who, are, uh, you know, who are your peers that whom you really, whose work you really like? You know, I've never, uh, my father was a, a bureaucrat. He worked for the Indian Revenue Service. And retired as member of the Central Board of Direct Taxes. He was, whenever his uh, peer, his bosses would call him out to dinner, he would say, are my kids invited? And invariably, eight out of ten times, they would say no. And my father would say, sorry, I'm occupied. My evenings are for my kids. I've lived with that diktat. I've never really hung out and uh, been a, a chef who plays around with other chefs, who goes out late at night and drinks with them and does all the other things chefs do. So uh, I have limited exposure to my peer. I call it a blessing because I am not thinking like them and just being a clone. But um, Mar Maricel Presilla is a woman who wrote Gran Cucina Latina. It's a Latin American cookbook. She also wrote the definitive book on cacao chocolate. Uh, Maricel lives in Hoboken, New Jersey. She's been a friend and a, a woman I look up to. Uh, Eliana de la Vega is perhaps the greatest Oaxacan chef from the state of Oaxaca in Mexico. Her moles, her salads, her cactus, her uh, simple uh, 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 bean and potato taco, her uh, uh, breakfast eggs are uh, things that I dream of and we cook together. She used to come to my farm. We've traveled in the US together. She's an inspiration. There's uh, uh, Gary Jenko, who's one of the most celebrated uh, multiple Michelin star chef in uh, San Francisco, very expensive food, but a man with a brilliant mind. I love his cooking. There's Sean uh, um, George Wong Erecton, whose uh, first one of his earlier restaurants, the Wong in Upper East Side in New York, is a restaurant I can go to and have cheer. Jojo, not Wong's, Jojo. I can go and eat just a couple of things there and I have tears in my eyes that I've eaten the best version of those dishes. There's uh, uh, Eddie Schoenfeld, who was one of my closest friends in my first book. I called him my best friend, brother, father, uh, uh, enemy, all in one. Eddie passed away last year. He was my greatest friend, my confidant, my teacher, my uh, guru of world travels and my culinary companion. With, from Eddie, I learned all about Jewish cooking and New York City life and Chinese cooking and most of all, living like a chef in a hungry gourmand and traveling the world for it. Eddie was a big hero of mine. Gail Green, we lost her earlier this year, was the Zarina of food criticism for the world. She was the 
food critic of New York magazine for over 40 years. Gail convinced me to become non-vegetarian at age 35. She also wrote in one of her reviews, I was the only vegetarian whose meat she ate. She was my closest friend <laughs> and my biggest enemy and admirer. She would push me to uh, uh, challenge myself further because she said I was one of the greatest cooks she'd ever met in her lifetime. And she also wanted me to keep honing my skills as a chef. With her, I traveled the world, discovering incredible food on a budget paid for by the magazine. I learned how to eat foie gras, monkey brain, fugu sperm, and all kinds of other things I wouldn't have eaten as a vegetarian. So there are many heroes, but these weren't chefs per se, but people who lived big lives, who thought bigger than themselves, who were world citizens, who were people with big minds and hearts, who were not narrowed down by their religions or nationalities, but became one with the planet because they were human beings before they were Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, or uh, Jewish. So these people taught me to be a human being and they taught me how to be bigger than myself. Nice. Uh, what do you think of uh, proliferation of reality television and uh, cooking shows, right? Like MasterChef and different in India and in the US as well. Uh, what do you think about the format? Do you think uh, they do justice? Good, bad, ugly? What do you think? You know, they're part of uh, good, bad and ugly. I think there's more bad and ugly than good in a lot of reality TV. And But unfortunately, we are stuck with it. It's become a big uh, marketing uh, industry uh, benchmark for success, for uh, income generation, for entertainment, for educatainment. It's It's... It's here to stay and we would rather accept it and make it better than ignore it and uh, pay a price for not pushing it into the right places. Um, MasterChef Australia, terrific. MasterChef India is more Bollywood than uh, uh, food, uh, but they're getting there. I think the chefs are putting an effort. I think the partners like Amul India, which are solid food partners, will hopefully take it to a better place, demand better from the producers and bring the focus to uh, honest dining and uh, cooking and celebration of India's food ways. I see too much fusion and crap happening in our Indian television and uh, entertainment uh, 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 avenues. We are into Jenny Pidja and uh, Dal uh, 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 Sushi. This crap is all Instagram uh, generation with very uh, weak legs to stand on and lesser imagination behind it and even lesser honesty, integrity and flavor. So the sooner we go past these tacky, cheap, uh, frivolent indulgences, the sooner we can get to serious eating and uh, appreciating and become richer, better, healthier citizens of India and the world. So I think uh, reality TV has very little reality in it. It's been created to uh, numb minds into becoming sheeple that allow corporations to get richer, uh, advertisers become uh, better uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, makers of uh, futures for larger corporations. So we need to be smarter citizens and humans and uh, uh, residents of countries and nations and uh, communities and police what people uh, sell to us. And uh, we can't blame it all on televisions and producers in these shows. You are what you eat, you are what you buy, you are what you are hungry for, and you are what you dream. So dream smart, eat better, demand better, and hopefully we'll get better. Initially, you mentioned about, you know, how Indian cuisine, like it's Indian food is being attributed with all the health ailments that people like we obviously per capita have more diabetics in the world, people with hypertension, cardiac issues and things like this. So, uh, is Indian cuisine inherently, and I know you said it, you don't agree with it, Indian cuisine authentically is not something that should cause these ailments. So, what do you think has, I mean, what actually happened that such things, you know, started becoming more frequent, especially today amongst Indians? And what changes can be made? Like, if you were to think of three, four changes at least, I know there would be a lot more than that that can actually make it a little healthier. We should chase fads less. We need to eat more home foods, more vegetables, let, less potatoes, paneer and chicken and beef and meat, all of the uh, mutton, less of that. 
plant-based should be the way to go forward. Plant-based, not eating French fries and 100 variations of potatoes and paneer, but leafy greens, grains, whole grains, pulses, legumes, lentils, and all the different vegetables that are rainbow colored and bring new textures and flavors and taste to our palates. We need to do that. We need to stop uh, eating the way the West does. We need to celebrate our local food ways. We need to eat what grows locally. We need to celebrate it. If it takes a little longer to cook, no worries. Do 10 other things while you're cooking. Cook as a family, cook together. Cook as neighbors, relatives and friends together, eat together. Somebody, some people can wash dishes, others can lay a table, others can tell a story, another can, uh, you know, lay the uh, fold napkins, but make it a collective art, an art form, and then everybody buys into it. And thirdly, you are what you eat, read labels, eat carefully, make sure you're buying real ingredients. India is a nation of dairy with a dairy surplus. <clears throat> but the uh, dairy in India often is made out of analogous ingredients that are not dairy really. A lot of our dairy, you can buy five-star hotels, Oberoi Taj and all others, have boxes and containers of cream, milk, uh, ghee, butter, that's dairy-like substances. They are non-dairy dairy. What are we doing? How stupid do we have to be? How maimed are we as uh, uh, honest humans that we are allowing these large corporations to feed us these fake ingredients? We, we are not, and what we've done is they may have erred. They were, they were fools themselves by corporations that were marketing what the West did better than butter dairy, better than butter butter. <coughs> and these were butters and dairy, dairy creams and all made with hydrogenated fats of uh, sunflower and palm oil. Studies for decades have now proven to the world, to every nation that thinks that dalda, what we have in India, is a heart attack insured by its ingestion. So there's no two ways. You'll get it. And it's banned in the uh, in North America, banned by the European Union. The corporations that make it over there are making it for the Indian and Malaysian and Singaporean market because we are dumb dodos that are still chasing and uh, buying them. So, you know, multinationals don't have a heart and brain. They're there to serve their purposes, banned in Europe and America. They're selling it in India. Worse still that they're making it now with palm oil, which is even worse than other vegetable fats. So we have to police our own uh, uh, ways of thinking. The minute we do that, we'll be a smarter people. We'll think better. It takes generations to overcome bad eating habits. We were once a poor people eating very well because we didn't have enough dairy. Stop eating and overindulging in ghee and coconut fat. These are fats we very cleverly did a tarka with. An Indian mother in southern India, northern India, and poor India had only so much ghee to have, and they ate it in the form of a tarka. And that tarka was magical. One little teaspoon of it for a family of six, eight, or 12 gave the scent, the flavor. It was amazing. What is it? Tripti. We got satiety. Today we can put, we can cook on it and we are seeing it floating on our dishes, dying of a heart attack and wondering how we got so sick. But our grandparents and theirs were very sensible. We didn't have all these cows traveling our planet. We can be a proud people by knowing we didn't add to the global warming in the numbers other nations have done. We were sensible. But we've lost our way somewhere and we need to come back to our old ways. The Ayurveda don't push ghee and uh, coconut milk and coconut oil. They push for mindfulness, for a veritable feast to be enjoyed with all kinds of ingredients, eaten in moderation, in small quantities, regionally inspired, locally sourced, ethically raised, with concern for tomorrow. The Vedas are very clear about it, that the planet is a shared entity, all human beings are equal, of becoming one with self and one with the divine, and having no duality in thought or deed or action. That's, you know, Advaita Vedanta, that we are one, that there's only one. And the sooner we understand that we are the purest people in our thought and uh, actions, and we become one with the planet. It's not a sexy story to sell. It's a tough story because you have to live and act and uh, breathe and contemplate and reflect and work hard. It's not an easy story to pass. 
for leaders, for teachers, for parents, for uh, uh, peers. It's easier to sell a Baba Ramdev than to sell the story of the Vedantas, a uh, Vedantic story of uh, being mindful. Mindfulness is a daily enterprise with no uh, gifts being afforded you. You have to police yourself. You have to be self-reliant. You have to be uh, self-questioning. You have to be a self-study. You have to look at the mirror and see honestly what you're being shown. And only then do you see the light of the day. And in doing so, you become one with self in the other. Hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I I think the most challenging thing whenever I try to eat healthy food is actually sticking to the discipline of it. It's really hard. So, I mean, uh, but healthy food, healthy food doesn't have to be distasteful. In fact, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's almost I mean, become synonymous has, that way. <laughs> it has. It's gotten a bad rep. Yeah. Because so you have to recondition. It's like any new habit. It's like learning how to wear a suit and tie. It looks. Tough, tough, tough. But then we see all our icons wearing suits and ties. We Indians used to wear chaddars and wore a kurta pajama and a Nehru jacket. Call our clothing ethnic. We call what we wore ethnic, what we eat ethnic, how we dance ethnic, how we speak ethnic. But when we look at a Hollywood star dressed up in a tie, we say, oh, that's fashion. But our clothing is ethnic fashion. We, we've been bashed and we are continuously calling ourselves inferior. And in doing that, we create these challenges for ourselves. Our food is the healthy, tasty, delicious, plant-forward cuisine of the planet. The reason I sit on the board of Harvard Medical School's Nutrition Advisory Council at Brigham and Women Hospital. They love my food. They find it tasty. They find it yummy. They find it exotic. They find it just everything the world needs today. We find it depressing, healthy, horrible. So, you know, it's just, it's, we have to change the paradigm. Yeah, that's a valid point. Uh, so in your opinion, how has the perception of Indian cuisine changed in the West and abroad, like outside of India over the years? And what needs to be done to elevate its status and representation further? Because you look at Thai cuisine or Lebanese, you know, or Italian, the manner in which it's spread around the world, you know, and the brand that this cuisine has been able to create. Uh, you know, I think there is some gap with Indian cuisine there. What do you think? I began with it. The gap is that we are not a self-respecting people. You said when I look at Indian cuisine, when I think of healthy cuisine, it's difficult to digest. When we think of our food as that, how can we be its salespeople? When we are embarrassed about our food, when we are thinking of it as being healthy and not so tasty, you know, it's 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 generational. It is. Uh, we, we, we've allowed us, we, the colonizers came and colonized our lands. They left our minds colonized by their BS. And today we are a victim, we are jailed, we are maimed, we are broken by a mindset that hasn't allowed itself to be unshackled. And the day we do that is the day we start thinking afresh and become one with the world and one with ourselves. And that's the beginning of the end of all that ails us. The Prime Minister can only do so much. We now have to become the primordial gatekeepers of our own lives. And we have to take our lives over from our colonized mindscapes and give them a new uh, growth uh, 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 and development avenue where old habits have to be left behind. New habits have to be inculcated. And we have to understand that the old ways can only teach us how to be richer versions of ourselves for tomorrow. And yes, they are more sustainable and more honest to our environment, our local geography, and what we were meant to be. They didn't suit the colonizers to let us be who we were, because when we are maimed and broken, we are sheeple that can be manipulated. And we need to uh, grab the uh, bull by the horns, which is our own self, and take us to more mindful uh, ways of being and living and celebrating and sharing and caring and nurturing. And in doing so, become the people we were meant to be and not what others around the world want us to be. It suits them to believe us confused and broken and challenged and lost. Because the more we are of all of that, the, the more they can puppeteer us into habits that enrich their coffers and empty ours. Yeah. I mean, essentially, be a more assertive and self-confident country uh, across all aspects and also in our cuisine. 
being proud of our heritage and also you know taking it further ahead india's beauty lies in india's uh, ever evolving uh, nation ever evolving people a very logical mindset and what we we are beacon of light when we go to our old advait uh, uh, vedanta with advait vedanta ways and also how we thought and became who we are we were one of the leaders of civil society always we uh, we are we pretty much a union of people of diverse types and kinds and uh, of different legends and traditions and ways of being but we came together with this uh, thought that we could uh, show the world how a union can be strong and agile and uh, relevant and uh, uh, sustainable without breaking and tearing itself apart into isms that can't be sustained by uh, oneness the vedas give us that opportunity the leaders of the west when they think they go back from you know, henry david thoreau being inspired by the vedas yeah. and the upanishads yeah uh, has given was gandhi's leader gandhi didn't know the vedas he learned it from uh, the, the, the henry david thoreau and thoreau learned it from the upanishads and the vedas that the world is one that the world needs us to be one that the planet has connections that can make us stronger and richer because we understand that when we are disparate and broken we are nothing bikre bikre tare hain hum lekin jhil mil ek hain hum sab bhartiya hain that we are shimmering stars in our individuality but when we come together as a galaxy of this radiant light we become better in our oneness than we were in our broken shimmering brightness so you know that's the uh, uh, incredibly wise indian way of being and we can still live with the world and the planet and still be ourselves we don't have to be assertive a certain has no room at the table but a mosaic where every being has a place of pride and yet together in our unison we become this great piece of art that has every part of the mosaic shining bright but even brighter because of the togetherness that comes in in a more holistically beautiful way so on that very optimistic and very poetic note uh, we come to the end of our show it was a fascinating conversation subir Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, guys, uh, for joining us today. Please don't forget to like, comment, and share, and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, see you around.